Seventeen years old. No, really? no. Okay. All right. I will call this meeting to order, and we'll begin with introductions. I'm Dan Wathen. I live here in Augusta, and uh, I'm the chair of the commission. And I'll call on to my left. I don't think you need to. Okay. Hi. Good morning, um, Dr. Ng. I'm a psychiatrist up in Bangor, Maine. And I'm Deborah Bader. I am a retired forensic psychologist. I'm Paula Silsby. I'm a retired federal prosecutor. Am I right? Ellen Gorman. I'm a retired judge. Jeff Rushlow, former district attorney and retired judge. Toby Dilworth. I'm a lawyer in Portland. And our staff present today. Ann Jordan. I'm the executive director. I'm Jim Osterreiter. I'm retired FBI and uh, investigator to the commission. And we have one other investigator, Brian McMaster, who is not here with us today, but will be at future meetings. Let me begin by just making a statement for the record. Uh, oh, I, I also want to say before that, that this is being live streamed today. And we also have ASL interpreters uh, who are included in the live stream and the process that we follow right along, sometimes complicated by where we are. Some facilities have better setups than others, but uh, it seemed to have worked well. The I'd like to make it just a statement of record that because we have issued a subpoena for Captain Reamer, the procedure with him will be slightly different than the others. Uh, and uh, for the record, it should reflect that the commission vote voted unanimously to issue that subpoena, uh, not for a lack of cooperation on his part, but just in order to preserve the sort of formality between the Army commission. Uh, we will, uh, therefore, only when we issue a subpoena do we use the oath. Uh, and so we'll be following that procedure. Captain Raymer. Captain Raymer will be our first witness today. We uh, had him here, I can't remember the exact date, but we didn't finish. And so we're going to try to finish up today. He'll be called upon first. So, Captain, you come forward and remain standing. Raise your right hand. First of all, could you state your name? Captain Jeremy Reamer. And you swear the testimony you'll give in the matter now hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. You may receive it. Thank you. And Toby Dilworth of the commission will lead on in the questioning at this time. Thank you, Chair Wathen. Good morning, Captain Reamer. Sir. Uh, are you represented today? No, sir. If there's a problem with the microphone. Can you, hear me? Can, can you get that closer to you? Uh, okay. I, I am not represented today. Again, if uh, you don't understand one of my questions, if my question isn't clear, let me know and I'll reframe it, okay? Yes, sir. Are you on any medications today that might uh, interfere with your ability to understand my questions or answer them accurately? No, sir. Now, we don't plan to retread the same ground that uh, we uh, covered at the last session, but um, we've had a chance to look at some of the documents we got on the eve of the uh, last session. So there may be some overlap, okay? Yes, sir. And in fact, uh, let's start with July of 2023. Yes, sir. Uh, while Robert Card was in New York and there was the incident uh, at the hotel. Um, after talking to First Sergeant Moat, you ordered Robert Carr to go to the hospital for mental health evaluation, correct? Yes, sir. And was Card obligated to comply with that order? Yes. What would have happened if he'd refused? Well, we would have, at that time, we were working on um, using all the resources available to us to get him there, but um, we actually didn't have to get to that point. I'm not, 
we didn't need to figure out the next step because he did end up complying with us. So um, that's that's what actually ended up happening. So I'm we didn't have to get to that point as far as what what would the next step would have been. Okay, but ultimately, could he have been court martialed for uh, failure to comply? There, yes. I mean, it is a lawful order. So if he didn't follow a lawful order for a command directed, we could go down that route. Yes, sir. Captain okay. Reamer, I'm having some difficulty hearing you. Could you pull right up to the microphone, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Better? Okay. Yes. Now, did you have access to uh, Robert Card's medical providers while he was at the New York hospitals? The medical staff? Yes. But, uh, I had a couple phone calls. Um, with them, but not necessarily it, like by the time I actually was down at West Point, uh, he was at four winds. Uh, and I did not, the last conversation that um, was had uh, was my first sergeant had spoken with them. Um, I was seeing if they would like, um, if we could have any visitors or so down there. And they said that they didn't uh, no, they could have no uh, visitors. Um, so I didn't actually end up visiting there uh, so essentially any kind of contact would have been via phone. Okay. Well, let's take it in steps. Let's start with Keller, the first hospital, right? Yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, did you go to Keller? I ended up, yes, going to Keller, uh, both on the uh, 16th of July, um, after the initial incident. And then I did follow up later when I was down there. Okay. And you had traveled from New Hampshire that day? On the 16th, sir. Yes. And what did you learn when you went to Keller? I spoke with the uh, on-call uh, psychologist um, where they, uh, he kind of gave me his initial uh, assessment and advised that he was going to be, um, they were going to be asking him to go to further care at Florence. Okay. Did he tell you that uh, Robert Card suffered from psychosis? At that time, no, he, he did not provide that. Um, did he at some point? Later on, um, he did provide me with uh, the medical document that that was his uh, evaluation, yes. Okay. Um, can you look in at the exhibit 14 in front of you? Yes, sir. And that's a uh, document drafted by um, Sergeant Moat, correct? Referring to the third page. Are you familiar with this document? It, it's a CCIR. Um, what is a CCIR? Uh, critical, uh, Commander's Critical Incident Report. Okay. I'm not sure if this was exactly like completely filled out by uh, First Sergeant or if he just provided the um, the main portion of N7. Um, he may have provided the uh, information and somebody else drafted it? Yes, sir. I can't, I can't confirm who exactly did this. Okay. And on the third page, first full paragraph, it says Captain Reamer arrived and filled out the command directive. And we spoke with the psychologist who came in to do the initial evaluation. The psychologist at Keller Army Hospital stated that he did believe Card was suffering from psychosis and as a result ordered him to go to Four Winds Hospital for a full evaluation, right? Yes, I see that, sir. Okay. So does that refresh your recollection that it it does, sir. Okay. And do you recall anything else that you learned from medical providers at uh, at Keller? What I can remember um, was the conversation um, with the on-call psychologist um, where he, after his uh, talking um, with, with Sergeant Card, he was glad that he was there uh, to get further help. Um, and that was 
kind of uh, that was that was what we initially talked about, sir. And then from what we've already talked about, he was glad that he was there because he was severely ill. Just that he, um, from his conversation, that he was glad that he was at a hospital getting uh, medical help. Yes, sir. Okay. Did he talk about uh, firearms or weapons at that time? He expressed concern um, about uh, the personally owned firearms that um, Sergeant Card had at that time. Yes. Weapons at home or at, um, access to military firearms? My understanding was um, his concern was more of the weapons at, um, at home at that time. Okay. And did you respond to that? I acknowledged that um, at the time I wasn't aware. I had heard that um, Sergeant Card had, um, like probably many um, residents of Maine, they, that he did own firearms at home. Um, I just think, acknowledged that I be, you believe he did have firearms at home. How did you know that, do you recall? Just from hearing it from uh, other soldiers who knew him better. Okay. So from Keller, Sergeant Card was transferred to Four Winds, correct? Yes, sir. And how much access did you have to the medical providers at Four Winds? Not much, sir. Okay. What do you recall about your conversations? Well, let's, let's start with who you talked to. Who did you talk to at Four Winds? At this time, I cannot recall anyone that I directly spoke with um, at Four Winds. You don't remember their names? At this time, I cannot, sir. Okay. What do you recall learning from them about Sergeant Carr's condition? From Four Winds, I cannot recall anything that I learned from them. Okay. Um, Let's look at uh, exhibit 10B in front of you. You see that? I'm working on it. Struggling to find 10B. Well, do you remember seeing a report of mental status evaluation? Uh, is... uh, Form 3822? Yes, the, is the one we talked discussed in my previous. Yeah. And at the bottom of the second page. Thank you. You see where it says command representative contacted. And then there's your name. It's about two inches from the bottom. Yes, I see that it has my name on it, yes. And so you were their primary contact or This was in regards to uh, from Keller. Okay. So and yes, I, I did speak with the the behavioral health provider listed. Okay, so this was filled out while he was at Keller. Uh, this is based off of his initial evaluation at Keller. Yes. Okay. And is it accurate? In terms of the comment section, with regard to the communications you had with the healthcare providers regarding his condition at that time, 
This document is dated July 23rd. Is this on, you're referring to the further comments on the bottom? Yes. So your, what is your question, sir? Just if you can rephrase it. Was this, is this comment section accurate with regard to the communications you had with healthcare providers as of that time, which is July 23rd? I mean, this, this does stay, but in terms of any follow-up care with the brigade medical officer and um, med, med board process, um, that I can't speak to, but... Okay. Did you, on page one, it uh, sets forth his diagnosis of unspecified psychosis, not due to sub, a substance or physiological condition. Did you do you see that? I do see that, sir. Were you told that uh, at the time um, on the when I initially went down uh, on the sixteenth? I cannot recall being told that specifically. Okay. Do you recall being told that while he was at either hospital? Uh, I cannot recall. I didn't have access to this until later on this form uh, due to my computer system being um, actually stand back. I did. They did provide me a physical copy of this. Um, so I did while I was down there. I did receive this um, okay. from them. And we touched we touched on this a little bit last session, but at the top in section six, the fifth box is checked and it says ensure the service me member attends all follow up appointments. Right. I see that is checked off. Yes, sir. And and that was a recommendation for you as the commander. It is in the recommendation for commander section, yes. Um, now, you testified a little bit about this at the last session. I just want to make sure it's clear. Did you feel you had trouble in following that recommendation? As a Army Reserve officer it is difficult. This form um, comes from an active duty um, hospital, and uh, it, I, there is difficulty to, to have this uh, transferred over to like a reserve, um, the Army Reserve, in the sense that in an active duty world, uh, you have access to the soldiers, you have more. Um, for instance, in another part in here that's checked off is um, you can move service members into barracks um, you because you have access to that. So that is, uh, and you see them day to day. And in some cases, if you move them into a barracks, you can have uh, assign a soldier to sit in the room uh, with them. Uh, so that is all stuff that is capable in an active duty uh, status. But as a um, army reservist, I, I only, um, after being released and, and in between um, battle assemblies, I do not, uh, it is very, very difficult because everyone is essentially back to civilians um, that I can't order someone to go to Sergeant Card's house and stay with them, with him. Um, uh, so it is, it is difficult to, to follow um, a lot of, a lot of these, uh, especially with certain things like firearms, um, having no jurisdiction or authority over his personally owned firearms, um, as it is uh, checked off in here, it's uh, it is difficult to answer your question. It is difficult to do in the Army Reserve capacity. Did you talk to Sergeant Card's nurse case reviewer? Which one, sir? Shane Pupo? I cannot recall a conversation with him. You may have? I cannot recall at the time. 
Okay. Do you recall any conversations you had with nurse case reviewers? What I can recall is I uh, saw emails um, to Saren Card um, and was I was CC'd on regarding follow-ups for his profile. Okay. And you received a number of those, correct? I don't remember the exact number, but yes, a few. And they all indicated that he wasn't following up, right? That I can't say it was it appeared to be a standard just follow up, um, whether it's extending the profile or that they needed him to um, sign a document. Um, but that was the emails. I can not saying that it wasn't he wasn't following based off just those emails. OK, what is a behavioral health profile? From my understanding, it's a profile that's provided um, that's. Um, essentially created uh, for the individual service member by a medical provider um, in regards to his behavioral health um, and a kind of a profile generally either limits um, what they're able to do, but uh, that's gen my general understanding of a profile. Mm -hmm. And for Sergeant Card, he was limited in what regard? I, I cannot, um, cannot recall right now, sir. Okay. Was he allowed to have access to military weapons? I, according, no, I do not believe he was able to access military weapons. Yes, sir. Was his commanding officer, you knew that, right? Yes, he was on it, yes. Okay. So let's, can you turn just briefly to exhibit 15? Yes, sir. That's an email from Shane Pupo to you and Robert Card, right? Yes, sir. It's dated July 20th? Yes, sir. And the first part is addressed to you, correct? Yes, sir. And it says, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me earlier today. Do you recall anything about that discussion? I cannot recall that discussion, sir. But he informs you that he's the assigned nurse case reviewer and that he is going to be your direct point of contact for all actions regarding the profile, correct? That's what he says, yes. Okay. And then he attached a DA-4856. Yes, right? sir. And what is a DA-4856? believe it is a counseling form, sir. Okay. And it provides... Directives and orders, correct? Well, this I'm... you see the third page? Yes, I'm looking at it right now, sir. Okay, it's pretty small. Yes, sir. But it's entitled Developmental Counseling Form, right? Yes, sir. And at the bottom. In paragraph number three, it says the ARMMC, which is the Army Reserve Medical Management Center, right? Yes, sir. Will case manage your active temporary profile. You are ordered to comply with any and all requests and directions made by the ARMMC. And that's an order to card, right? Yes, sir. And on the next page, the top, it says, soldiers are required to comply with lawful orders and regulations. Failure to comply with orders and regulations may result in UCMJ action and or adverse administrative action, right? Yes, sir. And then in the next section, paragraph one, you are ordered, and this is two card, you're ordered to make and maintain regular contact with your assigned ARMMC case management team and to submit all requested documentation and or information to them within 30 days of request, right? Yes, sir. And then he was ordered to uh, report to your unit commander the status of your temporary profile case at each battle <laughs> assembly and throughout the month as you receive updated information, right? 
That's what it says. Yes, sir. Did he do that? He did not. Did you ask him why he'd failed to comply with that order? I did not. Did you do anything to enforce the order? I did not. Then paragraph three, you are ordered to notify your unit commander immediately if you are unable to respond or comply with any request or information or action from AR MMC personnel. Did he do that? He did not. Number four, you were ordered to obtain and provide copies of all medical records, civilian and military, that relate to your temporary profile case to your unit commander and AR MMC personnel. Did you receive those copies? I did not. Did you follow up with them as to why you hadn't received them? I did not. Why not? This uh, counseling form, I did not actually, uh, due to my email access being down at the time, um, I did not access this until later on. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your answer. I apologize. Um, my email uh, was down uh, at the time, so I did not actually see this um, counseling form until later. So I was not able to um, follow up with him. When did you get access to it? That I can recall um, observing this. It wasn't until later in October. After the shooting? Yes, sir. So was it stuck in your inbox? I did not I did not um, see it until after the shooting. But you did receive it. I did see it in my email, yes, sir. Um Number five says you are ordered to reply and comply, to uh, reply and comply with all orders and correspondence you received from your unit commander. Did you give him that order or uh, verbally? I didn't. Sir. Now at the bottom it says uh, under leader responsibilities, unit commanders are responsible for monitoring their soldiers' IMR individual medical readiness status and ensuring compliance. I understand you didn't see this form in July or August, but did you understand that? I understand it's one of the responsibilities, yes, sir. Okay. Did you monitor Sergeant Carr's compliance? I received the um, I saw the, the follow on uh, emails. Um, so that was um, the kind of the monitoring that I observed was that they were attempting to reach out to him. Okay. So you didn't see this, you didn't open up this document until October. I can't, yes, sir. I can't recall opening up earlier, sir. So did you ever sign this document? I did not, sir. Do you know whether Card signed the document? I do not. Did you ask Sergeant Mo to check on any of these responsibilities we've, uh, or to follow up on any of these responsibilities we've addressed here? I did not ask why, the person. Why not? Well, due to uh, having not received, I didn't follow up um, with him at that time, with first time. But you, even if you hadn't seen this document, you knew it was your responsibility to ensure that he complied. Yes, um, but I did. I did not follow up with first time. Okay. So did Shane Pupo try to reach you again about the uh, fact that the 4856 hadn't been signed? I could not recall that he uh, he did outside of a... Do you remember that he 
sent emails saying that the form hasn't been I can't recall if the specifically the 4857 was what they're referring to or if it was just his profile. Or 4856, yeah. Uh, yeah, 4856. Were you in touch with other providers at the um, hospital, Four Winds? Not that I can call, sir. No. What do you recall? learning about Sergeant Card's uh, treatment at the uh, Four Winds Hospital. What do I recall about his treatment? Yeah. I cannot recall anything about his treatment, sir. What about his progress? I can, can't recall anything regarding his progress. Do you recall anything about your conversations with medical providers at Four Winds? At Four Winds, I cannot recall, no. Okay. Can you turn to paragraph to Exhibit 16? Yes, sir. That's an email from Patrick Dean to Michael Connor and CCing you as well as others, correct? Yes, sir. And it's dated July 25 of 2023? Yes, sir. Okay, who's Patrick Dean? Uh, Matt Sergeant Dean is, he plays a, a dual role. He's a full-time staff member for the battalion as well as he plays, uh, he is a committee chief uh, in my uh, in the company in, in your company uh, but currently not the battalion or the company commander at this time but yes uh, at that time it was my company yes okay you're no longer the company commander i am no longer no when did that uh, take place february this past february i believe the first part of february okay. changed over and why was that uh, my time um, in the in the Army Reserves is generally a two to three year um, time that you serve as a com as a commander in leadership. It's a standard um, thing, and uh, so I my time I had been there for two and a half years. So a new company commander came in. And what's your current assignment? I am a, an assistant S three in in the same battalion. S three is operations. Uh, work on uh, helping and uh, planning the operations for the entire uh, battalion. In, in SACO? Yes, sir. So let's go back to exhibit uh, 16. Um, who's Michael Connor? Messer and Connor. <laughs> He, he plays, a, he has uh, many hats that he wears, uh, but he is in the uh, battalion uh, as he uh, wears a hat as a uh, operations sergeant, as well as our, um, we call it S6, but it's basically networking, uh, computers, that kind of stuff. Okay. But I think in this role, he was handling a lot of um communications and in, in between uh, obviously uh, master and Dean and and him but you kind of acted as battalion and in this email Patrick Dean uh, summarizes information that you provided regarding the case manager at Keller correct
Yes, this, can you just rephrase the question? Sorry, I was just reading. Sure, it says, per Captain Reamer, the case manager for Card and Keller said that the original recommendation was for him, meaning Card, to be held for a longer period of time, but then she said he signed a 72 hour release form asking to be released, right? Yes. What did you know about this 72 hour release form? I think that this is referring to, and uh, it's kind of refreshing memory, uh, a conversation with a, um, and I can't remember the the, the female's name from, from Keller. Um, this, she uh, indicated uh, that that what normally happens is um, they held he signed a seventy two hours so um, that they would the standard process would have been that he would come back to Keller or within 24 hours. That was my understanding that it would be within a tw um, 24 hours that they would just kind of watch um, him before they released, uh, released him and that he was just basically advising that we may need to extend the orders. Okay. So Is it fair to say that Card wanted to get out sooner than the doctors thought he should get out? Yes, from my conversation with Ostef or Ostef Sarn Hodgson, yes. That was and they said Keller has a 24-hour safety watch. That was from my understanding of how their process works. Okay. And who had told you that? I be believe a, a female. I can't really like I said, I can't remember from, from Keller. Was it the case manager? I cannot recall if it was specifically the case manager. And it says this might require an order extension. What did that mean? What he's referring to is if it went past uh, his orders that we may need to extend his orders, allowing him to be, which which is possible. Um, you just need to do it ahead of time so that he is covered um, on, on orders at that time. His orders to go to New York and train people? That was his initial orders, yes. So you're going to have to extend the period that he was um, participating in this um, program for the reserve? Yes, is to ensure he had he was covered by the Army. Yes, sir. Okay. And so you knew enough to explain that to um, Sergeant Dean. Yes, I, I had reached out, um, understanding that they did that if we needed to extend his orders, or at least to give them a heads up, that if we had to extend orders, that they start that process. Okay. And then there were discussions about how this was his uh, time at the hospital was going to be paid, correct? Can you re rephrase? Well, let's let's look at the next page. That's from uh, Christina Gagnon. Yes, it is an email from her. Yes, she's the battalion training administrator. Yes, sir. Okay. And she's in the second paragraph, I need to know what the current need timeline is and when we might know. Right? Yes, I see that. And did you provide the the information for her? I, I updated battalion as we, um, as I got it. Um, generally, most of the information I was getting while he was at Fort Wins was through Staff Sergeant Hodgson. So I attempted to fill in um, Mrs. Gagnon, who kind of represented the battalion as far as um, what his timeline looked like. Then on the next page, it's an email from um, Patrick Dean to uh, Gagnon and Connor and CC and you dated July 26, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And it says, 
And the first line, Captain Reamer got me up to speed on the situation and, and wanted to be sure I was tracking since his order end date is approaching along with the rest of the TPU at West Point. What did you tell Patrick Dean? Yeah, that I can recall was that it looked like he was gonna be in the hospital longer than his orders. Um, I believe his orders ended a few days prior to uh, the remainder of um, the unit. Uh, so I just wanted to inform them that it looked like he was gonna be in the hospital longer than his orders. Okay, and you knew that from talking to the personnel at the hospital? That was yes, the, the the sense that I got when I talked with with them that they he he was going to be there longer. So how often were you talking to them? Uh, this was I can't recall the exact number of times I had a conversation, but it, it was not many times. Uh, maybe uh, I think this email um, chain kind of came through one conversation I had with with them. But you were in touch with the case manager. I don't know if she was the case manager, but yes, the female from Keller. Okay. Let's go back to Exhibit 10B again. We talked about this at the last session, but I, I just want to go over a few things. In section six, um, about 10 of the 10 boxes down, it says restrict access to or disarm all military weapons and ammunition, no range duties, right? Yes. And that was because he posed a threat to others, right? Their assessment, yes. Did you agree with that assessment? Well, I trust the medical personnel to assess it, yes. And in the comments, it says that you should, the chain of command should stay engaged in CARS care, right? It says that, yes. And measures should be taken to safely remove all firearms and weapons from him. And you understood that, right? Yes. And I also understood that that was already um, in the works due to uh, the coordination between Mr. Stassar and Harchin and his family to remove the firearms from his home. Okay. And did you also speak to Mike Kelly? about uh, having carts, firearms removed? I cannot recall a conversation regarding his firearms. Let's look at, do you have 10E in front of you? The 10E? E is in Edward. E. Yes, I have it, sir. Okay, in the middle section, the progress note that starts 725, spoke to Mike Kelly at Four Winds. Yes, I see, see it. that. Yep. On the third line, it says, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly is calling uh, service members' command to have all firearms removed from service members' home, right? I, I see it, yes, sir. Okay, do you recall that conversation with Mr. Kelly? I do not, no. Okay. Um, could it have happened you just re don't recall, or uh, do you think it never happened? I cannot recall. So, as I understood your testimony from the last session, 
you said that you were relying on family members to remove the uh, guns from Card's house. Is that right? Yes. The, How, the the plan was to have the family remove the weapons. Explain the, the plan. Um, from my understanding, from speaking with Seth Sarn Hodgson, uh, he had coordinated uh, after speaking with uh, Card in the hospital. Um, and Card consented to having and the family agreed to remove the firearms from his personally owned home. Okay. So how did that come about in terms of your conversation with Hodgson? Why was Hodgson involved? Hodgson decided to fill me in on and call me and update me on what was happening um, or his conversations with Card. While while Card was in the hospital? Yes, because Card was, was only speaking with him. Okay. Did you try to reach Card directly? No, I did not try to reach the card directly, no. Okay. Based on the last, um, basic with the, the conversation when my first heart had was that he didn't wish to speak with or um, didn't wish to have any visitors. Um, so, and I knew that he was speaking with Hodgson. Okay, so Hodgson is Card's good friend, right? Yes, sir. And did you talk to Hodgson about the need to get the guns out of Card's house? He was already aware uh, that that was an issue. I, I mean, I did speak with him regarding the, the personal and firearms. Um, and he was already aware that that was kind of, that was a point of uh, contention when he was speaking with, uh, being on the call with with card in the hospital okay um, so uh, how many conversations did you have with Hodgson about getting the guns out of card's house i can't recall the exact number of conversations but i had a, a couple conversations and H Hodgson had um, indicated that he had reached out to the family and card consented to having um, his family remove the firearms from the home well, tell me about that. He, what do you mean he indicated? What did he tell you? Uh, what did Hodgson tell me? Yeah. He told me that while well, a conversation with um, Sarin Card while in the hospital, he, um, Sarin Card consented to um, have him coordinate, coordinate with the family to remove the firearms from the home by the family. Okay. And then Hodgson told you that was the was going to happen. That the coordinations were made, and that the the family was aware, and that was the plan. Yes, sir. And did Hodgson tell you who he was talking to at the family with the family? I cannot recall exactly if it was his father. I think his father was brought up as being maybe one of the point of contacts. Was his brother mentioned? Believe he was mentioned. I can't. Re I can't recall. Exactly. Do you remember what Hodgson said about Ryan? I cannot recall. And, and so he said he was going to contact the family, and then he said that he did contact the family, and they agreed to remove his guns. My understanding was that um, the agreement, um, you know, that an agreement was made, and that the family agreed to remove the weapons from from the home. But you're not sure who in the family? I cannot recall exactly who. Is it a detail you just forgot, or did you never know who was supposed to remove the guns? I don't know who specifically. Um, I know that Sergeant Hodgson had spoken with the father. I'm not sure if the brother was involved either, but I just know that the family was uh, agreed to remove the firearms. Okay. Um, we have received from the, or through the Army, some of your text messaging history. And I'd ask you to look at Exhibit 22. Yep. Do you recognize that? Yeah, it's my text message. Now, this is in the same order that we received them from the Army. And frankly, there's, there are, they seem incomplete. 
For example, on the first page, it says, and I do remember calling him and explaining I can't remove them. He said, okay. Can you give us some context? This is a conversation you had with Hodgson, right? It is. Okay, so tell us about the context for this. The context for this is that Hodgson um, has a a um, legal matter outside of the uh, army um, that prohibits him from being able to uh, be around uh, firearms. Okay, so was there a text before this? I believe this conversation was um, one that Hodgson, uh, he had, then the, the follow up was that he had a, sent me a screenshot of his phone call log. Um, and this was um, after uh, the shooting when I was speaking with him, we were talking. Um, that was his recollection of his conversation. And then he sent me the screen uh, shot of his call log. Okay, well, it's illegible, at least in my copy. Um, but you think this was after October 25th? When Hodgson sent this to me, uh, yes, this was this was after. And is Hodgson, in effect, telling you that he remembered calling Card and explaining that because of his uh, domestic violence conviction, he was not allowed to uh, remove the guns himself? I can't, I don't know if he had that conversation with Card. I know they were close. So I can't recall if that was the conversation he had. What did you understand Hodgson was telling you in this? Well, in, in this, as I just explained that, um, he was referring to when he says, I can't remove them. That's the, the domestic violence thing uh, issue that he was going through. Okay. And that was why he couldn't personally move them from the house. Yes. So but he had also coordinated um, to have the family, but he could not know. Okay. And on the next page, there's uh, a text dated July 25. Is, is the blue from you? No, this is not from um this is this is this is between uh I think this is a screenshot from from Hodgson. Um this is, this yeah, this is this is the conversation between Hodgson and I believe the father the father. Okay. And it's dated July 25th at 7 32 p.m. And you think that this is a screenshot that uh Hodgson took of his own phone and sent to you after the shooting? Yes, sir. And it says you have permission to pick up your son's weapons and keep them locked up. Right? I see that, yes. Okay. And then it says, bring Kobe with you. Do you know what that refers to? I believe Kobe is Sergeant Card's son. Yeah. Was that, do you know, understand what that meant? Uh, I'm assuming you'd have to speak with Hodgson specifically on what he was referring to. But my understanding is that he was having, asking to have his son um, go along to help get the weapons out. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm card son. But did I just tell you um, about his communications in July with the family members? You know, the conversation I had with 
Hodgson in, in July was that he had coordinated with the family uh, to have the weapons removed. And you yourself didn't have any direct conversations with Card about removal of his guns from his house? No, I did not have any direct conversations. And did you know the family dynamics of the Card family? No, I did not. Did you know whether Card got along with his siblings, his brother? No, I did not. Do you know uh, uh, whether his parents are um, elderly? I did not, I assume based on the age. Now, We talked a little bit at the last session about the fact that under this procedure, there was no um, under this procedure, Card could revoke his authorization at any point, right? I mean, from my understanding, it's a a civil agreement. And he could say, I want my guns back anytime. Theoretically, yes. Well, and they would have no legal uh, no legal right to keep those guns away from him, right? From what you're saying, yes. So this was not a good plan, was it? I think it's a viable plan. It's one that's used often to have the family remove the personal firearms. Well, you, you've you agreed with the proposition that families can't police their own, right? No. You don't agree that? Uh... I think the families can police their own. And if the families don't deem that they can't, they can't police their own, then they should seek um, local law enforcement for assistance. Well, they or... did. This family did seek law enforcement assistance, didn't it? They did, yes. And as early as May. Yes. Okay. Um, let's get to this issue. Let's turn to Exhibit 12. And I ask you to, are you there yet? I am not, sir. Is 12 with one of the other exhibits? It's one of the older ones. You have it? I, I, do, I do not, sir. I can do another copy. Okay. That's a transcript of your interview with the uh, Maine State Police and Army Special Agents after the shooting, right? It appears to be, yes. I ask you to turn to page 49. I'm on about 49. Three, yes. 49. About three quarters of the way down the page, JR is you, right? Yes. And you say, I think the family would have the best, but I mean, I also, the same point, going through this whole incident with them, the family wasn't as open to us as uh, as trying to reach out to them. 
right? You said that. Correct? I see that, that, that the okay. train of And then they say the TJ, who is Terry James, says families can't police their own, right? You see that? I see that, yes. And what did you say? I say, yeah. Okay. So did you agree with them when you said, yeah? I mean, At this time, when I was having this conversation post the shooting, um, yes, I agreed that obviously the family um, may have struggled and, and, and had issues with him. Um, but at the time when the the uh, coordination to remove the firearms was occurred. I did not think that the families couldn't police their own. No. You had no knowledge of this family. It, uh, in what regards? Like you, what you said, you didn't know anything about the family dynamics. I I, I don't know the the dynamic of the family. No. Okay. You didn't offer uh, to store the guns at the reserve unit safe in Saco, did you? No, I did not. Did you consider it? No, due to the agreement that the family was going to remove the firearms, no. Would it have been preferable to store them at the Saco uh, unit's storage locker? I don't, um, can't speak to that because it didn't occur. So I'm not sure if it would have been preferable or not. It was an option, wasn't it? I mean, we we can reach out, and if people voluntarily wish to to provide the weapons, we can. Uh, but I have not done that, or I've not experienced having to do that. There are the issues that come from it, or if there are any. So, did anybody consider it as an option that you know of? That I know of, no. That I I cannot. Um, I'm not aware of anyone um, asking that. Raising it as an option? I'm not aware, no. Okay, but it wasn't considered and rejected as an option? That I'm aware of, no. Okay. So is it fair to say that you used Hodgson as a go-between between, between Card and the unit when he was in the hospital? He was my... Uh... By, yeah, he, he's the one who provided me information what was going on in the hospital, yes. Was Hodgson, besides making sure that, or supposedly making sure that the guns had been removed, was he also supposed to monitor the attendance at, uh, at the mental health appointments? No, he wasn't required, no. Who was supposed to monitor Card and make sure he was attending his appointments? I cannot recall who was supposed to be the one uh, doing that, but generally it would be the next his next level leadership. Well, that raises a question. What's um, that question? Hodgson is an E6, right? He is, yes. And card is an E7. Yes, it was, yes. And moat uh, was an E8. Correct. And moat was a good first sergeant for you, right? Yes. Why didn't you have him be in charge of the removal of the guns? In the armies, we, we have no authority or jurisdiction over the firearms. So to have him remove the firearms, we, we, we can't, we don't have the authority to do so. Why didn't you have him manage that issue rather than Hodgson? It, it did not occur, so I... Was it consistent with the chain of command? In this unique scenario, uh, Hodgson knowing the the family better um and him filling us in and having an agreement already in uh in place 
that it, it seemed that the family was already um, agreed to to this plan uh, to remove the firearms. So I did not have um, anyone else follow up. But you were relying on an E6 to direct the activities of an E7. I was relying on a friend who had deeply concerned for his uh, um, for card to to help facilitate this. Yes. And so you decided to go outside, not to use the chain of command in this regard. The agreement regarding the, the firearms was already um, established uh, and the plan was already put in place. So we, we understood that that was the plan okay. to have the family remove the firearms. To this day, do you know whether the firearms were ever removed from Card's house? I do not. And between his release at Four Winds in early August to mid-September, um, since Card's release, that is, did Hodges ever tell you the, the whereabouts of the guns? Not that I can recall, no. Did you ever ask? I know that when I spoke with him, I believe he had mentioned that the father may have a safe in his the father's home that the the weapons may be moved uh, to. That was kind of the only conversation I can recall at this time. Between his uh, cards release from Four Winds in early August and mid September, did Hodges ever tell you the card was skipping his counseling? I cannot recall if he, between that time, so when he was released in August till September, I don't recall anything regarding his counseling, being told anything regarding his counseling. What about his uh, taking medications? Did uh, Hodgins, uh, Hodges ever tell you, you that um, Card was taking his medications? I believe um, I did have a conversation with Hodgson where he did mention that I can recall that he mentioned that he was taking his medication. Um, I think this was shortly after his release um, from the hospital uh, that, that I can recall. When was that? I cannot recall the specific date. But it was it was shortly after. You were receiving emails though that he was not attending, that Carter was not attending his medical appointments, right? I was receiving emails of follow-on, um, follow-up emails regarding uh his profile. Okay. Well, there were numerous, well, at least three emails from Shane Pupo saying that uh, he wanted to get uh, an update on the behavioral health profile and that um, Card wasn't responsive. And you were copied on those emails, right? Yes, it was the, the follow up regarding um, that, the, the, regarding his profile and so you knew he wasn't going to those appointments, or I mean, I don't know if he wasn't making the appointment. I can't recall that just based off of the emails. But the emails is that he had not, um, my understanding, had not followed up with the the signing up for the profile. So you placed a lot of responsibility on. Um, Hodges, didn't you? You relied on him a lot in this regard. With regard to Sergeant Card, Hodgson was his 
um, best friend. Um, so he, um, and he was filling me in on, um, on what, on both his personal stuff as well as what was going on with card. And you had Ryan Card's contact information yourself, but you never called him. I did not call Ryan Card. Now, the Army made a timeline of these events. Do you recall that? I remember being a part of creating a timeline, yes. Okay. And this was done after the shooting, right? From the timelines that I was involved, yes. After. Okay. Let's look at Exhibit 17. That's an email from Christina Green to uh, you and others. And it attaches the timeline, right? Yes. So who authored this timeline? A uh, combination of people. I'm not sure the specific timeline who who was involved in creating or actually doctoring it and writing it up. Um, but I believe it was a couple levels up in my chain of command. Did you do any of the uh, drafting? Of this? Yeah. No, I was just a part of conversations and how this was created. My information was used in it. So you gave them information that was put into this timeline? Yes. Did you think it was accurate? Yes. Okay. Now this is really small writing. But uh, on July 15th, the entry is uh, the first sergeant in uh, the second sentence, first sergeant Moe called Captain Reamer because Sergeant Card was inebriated and displayed aggressive behavior with another soldier. They decided to let Sergeant Card sleep it off, right? Yes. Okay. Was Sergeant Card known for drinking heavily while on uh, the tours to uh, West Point? I have. I, I I cannot recall. I I don't know. Did you ever have any reason to suspect that Card was a heavy drinker? No. Then on uh, the 16th of July, says that uh, Sergeant Hart Hodgson, friends, Sergeant Card's best friend, in the same unit and former roommate, called Captain Reamer and spoke for seven minutes regarding Sergeant Card's initial incident. Sergeant Hart Hodgson expressed concern for Sergeant Card. What do you recall of that seven minute telephone call? That conversation was um, happened. He called me because um, he had heard um, through some of the other unit members that an incident had happened and he wanted to know what was going on with Sergeant Card. Um, I filled him in on what I knew, um, but he, uh, so that, that was what that conversation was. You recall anything else? No, that it was just um, just a conversation where he was just concerned about what happened. Um, and what I can recall, he was just concerned and I just filled him in on that he was at the hospital seeking help after being command directed. And on uh, the 20th of July, um, the order was um, issued that he was not the card was non-deployable and was not to have access to military weapons, right? Yes, that's referring to the document we spoke about earlier. 
Then uh, on the 20th of July, it refers to the um, 4856 that we looked at before, and it was supposed to be returned no later than August 17th, was not returned, right? Correct. And then on 25 July, it says, Hodgson expressed concern to the unit that Sergeant Card had personal weapons. Sergeant Card agreed to have the weapons removed. Sergeant Hodgson talked to Sergeant Card's father, advising Card's father to remove the weapons. Sergeant Hodgson informed the unit he was working with Sergeant Card's family to assist in the removal of the weapons from Sergeant Card's residence. And then it's uh, redacted a bit. And it says, additionally, Sergeant Hard is under CID investigation for stealing HMMWV. What is that? It's a Humvee. Okay. So does this refresh your recollection? This is the time period Yes. Hodgson and you were discussing this? Yes, it was in the, kind of the middle of after I was down there discussion regarding the, the, the firearms and the family, um, the, the the plan to have the family remove the firearms. Okay. And then on 2nd of August, it says Hodgson called Captain Reamer in reference to picking up Sergeant Card on August 3 at Four Winds. Right? Yes. Is that the first time you learned that Card was going to be released from Four Winds. That was, I know that he was looking to, um, after some of the conversations I had with Hodgson, that he was, that Card was looking to try to get out um, earlier, um, and there was to be a hearing of some sort. But this is referring to um, the actual, or Card end up calling Hodgson and advising that he was being released the next day. And that's how you learn. That is how, yes. And then um, it refers to the September 13th date where um, Hodgson reports to you that uh, Card had uh, punched him. Yes. And... On the 15th of September, it notes that was the last time you had contact with Sergeant Carr, right? Yes. It says Captain Reamer spoke directly to Sergeant Carr. Sergeant Carr indicated that he was upset regarding the summer incidents. Sergeant Carr said he had to work and that he would not be at the battle assembly. Sergeant Carr did not indicate any threats mentioned the retirement the possibility of retirement and it lists from uh, august 12th uh, to late october the all the appointments that uh, card missed right it, it it does okay now let me ask you about the uh absences from the battle assembly see what's the policy so when a uh, soldier doesn't show up to battle assembly um they are marked down um as what we call a u or an unsat uh, meaning that if there is no if he did not reach out to his chain of command did not provide a document called an rst um, which is, I can't remember the exact term, but basically it's um, acknowledging that they wouldn't be there um, and they're planning on to make up the the, the work at another time. Um, that So if someone did not show up, they would be marked down as a U. Um, and as the leadership, um, his, uh, his next level leadership would then uh, attempt to make contacts uh, to see if there's any form of contact, um, whether 
um, you know, by, by phone, by email, um, and uh, they would document that. And then, um, then what ends up happening, if, because they obviously don't show up, um, a, uh, a U letter, an unsat letter, be sent to the home of record. Uh, and that, that's the process, yes. So in terms of the excuses that are um, viable, <laughs> uh, can you just say, I have work to do? I'll make it up some other time. I mean, sometimes, yes, there's civilian jobs have work conflicts. Um, and that, um, I mean, that is, some people do use that as a, as a reason why they would not be at battle assembly. Okay. So for, you, you didn't have a battle assembly in August, did you? We did not. You had them in September and October. Yes. Okay. Was card excused from either of those? He was, um, I believe he was used or, or unsat for both. He called you in September and said he wasn't going to be there, right? The day before, yes. Mm -hmm. And did he know he was going to get an unsatisfactory? Did you tell him that? I did not in the conversation I had. No, I did not. But it is a known um, that if you don't show up to the battle assemblies and it's in regards to the reason you, we kind of have an uh, if you last minute things, unless it's like a family emergency or something like that, or if it's something that you know you're, you're supposed to be at battle assembly, um, then you know, any last minute things regarding work um, is usually um, put in under a U unless there's some other circumstances surrounding. Okay. So there's some flexibility on the part of um, getting excuses, right? Yes, there there is discretion. Okay. He had 12 unexcused absences within a one-year period. Didn't he? I cannot recall exactly how many years he has. Okay, look look at Exhibit Nineteen. Nineteen. Is that from you to card? Yeah, this is the U letter that is sent. Okay. And it's dated 23rd of October. Yes. Right? Okay. And in paragraph three, it says, unless the uh, most recent absences are excused, you will have accrued 12 unexcused absences within a one year period. Right? Yes. And the limit is nine. Yes. Okay. So if I can clarify by nine, it it is the um it is the threshold in which then you can start what they call an unsatisfactory packet, which is basically removing. Uh, a separation packet that so you have to get a, a minimum of nine within a calendar year um, and then that gives the leadership ability to start that unsatisfactory factory okay and then uh, on the second page in paragraph nine you say i hope that as a result of this letter you will take immediate steps to improve your attendance right that's what it says yes okay so why not send them correspondence like this but saying I want you to attend your behavioral health treatment. This is a um, this letter uh, is a pre filled out um, uh, memorandum that is done uh, by. It's not actually completed. I did not write this whole thing. It is sent to me and I sign. Um, and it is generated by um, our um, personnel. Um, 
actually, I'm not sure if it's done exactly by what we call our S1 or our personnel um, group, or if it's done by uh, another um, organization higher than that. So it's boilerplate. It's, it's just boilerplate. It's it's a yeah. It's it it's a pretty like, yes. It's it's one that's sent to everybody the same format. Um, just it just fills in the dates specifically that they missed and then how much they had occurred accrued. And then it's sent to the command to sign, and then it is uh, certified and it's sent um, to their home record. Okay. Let me uh, interrupt. We've been going for an hour and a half. And for the benefit of the court reporter and the interpreter, we'll take a 10 minute break.
may continue. Thank you. Did you uh, send a similar letter in September for uh, cards absence that month? If I yes, there would have been one. And did you send them by mail or email? It's sent by certified mail, sir. Okay. I I sign it. They the our S one sends it to me. Um, I sign them. It goes back to him and then they um, certify it out. Okay, so let's turn to September and you received a text at two in the morning <laughs> about uh, from uh, Hodges, right? Hodgson, yes. Um, and if you look at exhibit 22 on the fifth page, You see that uh, text. I see it in exhibit, exhibit five. You, you got it in exhibit five too, right? Yes. The one to you is a little different, isn't it? Say that again. The one on uh, exhibit 22, page five, is a little different. Give me a second to find exhibit 22. Maybe there's a, some confusion. My page five is not what you're referring to. Six, six. Page six, I think. Yeah, he was Sir. referring to five. Yeah. Well, there's an exhibit five. And page six. Oh, I see. Yes, I see it. Okay. It, and it adds at the end, I just don't know where he's up and down, right? That's what it says in the bottom, yes. Okay. So you received this, or you you got it, uh, you read it the, the morning. You didn't read it at two in the morning. You read it at around seven or eight? The one I got up, yes, sir. Okay. And you talked to Sergeant Mo. Yes, sir. Okay. And briefly explain what you said to Sergeant Mo. I believe we discussed this last time. But uh, I woke up, I contacted First Sergeant Moat, um, asked if he had received this. He stated he did, um, and that he had already reached out to Hodgson um, regarding follow-up um, information and follow-up on this. Um, and that was kind of the initial, that I can remember, that was kind of our initial conversation was confirming that he, you know, in fact, did get this. Um, and we started uh, figuring out the next steps. Um, and um, yeah, that, that was the conversation I had with first time mode. And when you say figuring out the next steps, what do you mean? Just the, what to do with this information. Um, that's what I mean. Okay. So he told you in this text that um, Cards still had those firearms, right? Are you referring to concerned that his weapons are still in the car? Yeah. Well, that's what he said, yes. And so you knew the card had the firearms. If he had given them up at some point in time, he had them back. not so the conversation i had with first sergeant he had spoken with um spoken with first or hodgson regarding um this and my recollection is that first sergeant um asked if he had seen any weapons he said no um he had not seen any of the, the firearms so based on my conversation with first sergeant um that 
I see that it states in his text messages, but he also then, when first time I reached out to him, didn't say he saw them. Okay. Well, you, from my conversation with first time, yes. He's threatening the unit that's in Saco and other places with shooting them up, right? That's what it says, yes. With weapons. Yes. And then he says, when I dropped him off, he was still concerned. He was concerned his weapons were still in the car. What did you take that to mean? That that was Hodgson's, what Hodgson was referring to, was that when he dropped him off, he, being uh, car, had weapons in the car. Was concerned that they're in the car. And he thought that they that car had taken them to the unit and nobody had searched his car when he was at the uh, Saco Reserve Center, right? That's what he's referring to, yes. And normally are cars searched? No. And you went to Saco on what day? When was the next time you went to Saco? Oh, the following day. Okay. And you saw the Saco police officers uh, parked nearby? Yes, I did. And that didn't surprise you? No, it didn't. No. Okay. In fact, you sort of expected that, right? I did, yes. Because Card posed a threat to the unit. We took the we took the, the information that he had sent us in the text as serious, yes. And around quarter of eight that morning, you talked to two Saco police officers, right? Yes. At this reserve center. Yes, they came in and spoke with me. And they had been part of the Saco police team that was protecting the uh, reserve. They were in the area, yes. Well, of the arm of the reserve center, yes. To protect it, right? I would, yes, I would assume. Okay, and Exhibit A, excuse me, Exhibit Eleven is the transcript of your conversation with them. I'm there. And on the uh, page at the bottom marked 81, about a third of the way down, you say, I'm a cop in New Hampshire, so we do it a little bit different than how you guys do it. What did you mean by that? What I was referring to this is that um, not so much specific uh, specifics, but just being a cop in New Hampshire, we have different laws, different regulations. Um, and I was just referring to the fact that there are different policies and rules and regulations. What specifically were you referring to? That we have different policies and we have different, you know, different state laws. Um, I'm just referring to the fact I come from a different state um, with different laws and regulations. Okay. Were they material? They were what? Sorry. Were, were they... In I mean, why why mention it? I'm I'm just trying to fill in the recollection before prior to this this the the line that you're referring to. It's, it's more to just provide that officer that to, that I um, come from a law enforcement background as well. Okay. And then halfway down, you say um, you're really asking for a uh, 
check well well being just to make sure that he's good, right? Is that still on the same page? Yeah, halfway down. Oh, yep. Yes, I see that. Yep. But you were asking more than that. You were asking for Sagat Hawk Sheriff's Office to do more than just make sure that he's good, right? Well, I was asking them to go out and put eyes on him and, and check on and check his well-being. And to see if he was a threat to himself or others. Well, for them to make that determination, yes. But you had concerns back in July that he was a threat to himself or others, right? Which is why he was sent to the hospital for evaluation, yes. And based on the text he had sent 24 hours before this, or not even 24 hours before this, you had you thought he was still a threat, right? You mean Hodgson's text 24 hours prior? Is that what yeah. you're referring to? Yeah. I mean, yes, we received that. Um, we treated it seriously. Um, I also spoke with Card later on that day on the 15th um, and spoke with him. Um, and he was angry? I mean, he was he was angry about the events over the, the summer. Um, Two that, months before? Yes, when he was down at, at West Point, yes. Okay, what did he say or do that made you think he was angry? Well, he stated he was just angry um, about how it all went down and that he would have to now work more um, and that he confirmed that he wasn't um, going to be at the reserve center or he wasn't going to be at uh, BA because he would have to work and that he was just ready to retire. Did he say anything about um, his inability to get guns as a result of his hospitalization? I could <laughs> not recall that part of being the conversation. But he didn't make any specific threats in his conversation with you? No. Okay. Just that he was angry and he wanted to punch um, Sarn Reed, which is the same guy he got into um, the altercation, if you will, back in September. Did you ask him where the guns were? I did not during that conversation. No. Why not? Just the way that the conversation led. Um, I did not. Did you ask him why he wasn't attending his uh, appointments? During that conversation, I did not. And you didn't ask him about medications? I did not, no. Okay. Then uh, on the next page, in your conversation with the psycho police officers, you described uh, Hodge's report to Sergeant Moat, right? There's conversation with Sergeant Moat. Yeah, at the top of that page. On page 82, about a third of the way down, it's, it's, you say he was unable to really give any specifics. Yes, I see that. Yep. Okay. And the guy only specifically mentioned one of my soldiers, meaning Reed, right? Yes. And said he wanted to punch him in the face. That's what and it says. And then he, he did say, you know, that he would shoot places, but never specifically mentioned here. Right? Do you see that? I, I see it, yeah. Okay. So were you summarizing, trying to summarize Moat's conversation with Card? I mean, with Hodson, rather? I believe during this portion of the conversation, um, I was trying to answer the officer's questions, which also, yes, summarizes kind of my first earnest conversation with Hodgson. But let's look at what Moat said about his conversation with um, Hodgson's that night. Let's turn to exhibit four.
on the second page. Give me a sec, I'm still trying to get to exhibit four. You have it? I do not. Okay, well, let me just represent to you that according to the Sergeant Schofield cut and pasted Sergeant Moat's correspondence to him. Do you recall that? I don't see the exhibit, so I can't okay. recall. Well, according to um, Sergeant Mo, Card called at uh, two thirty that night that morning to say that Card had assaulted him. Excuse me. I take that back. Oh, I'm. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have document three? Document three so might be have. Do we have that? Yeah. You see that? I see the document three. Night before last at approximately 2.30. You with me? Night before last. Yep. Another soldier that is friends with Card called to tell me that Card had assaulted him. They were driving home from the casino when Card started talking about people calling him a pedophile again. When Hodgson told him to knock it off because he was going to get in trouble talking about shooting up places and people, Card punched him. Hodgson was able to get out of the car and made his own way home. According to Hodgson, Card said he has guns and is going to shoot up the drill center in, at Saco and other places, right? That's what it says. He also said he was going to get them. Since the commander and I are the ones who had him committed, we are the them. He also said I was the reason he can't buy guns anymore because of the commitment. Arson is concerned the card is going to snap and commit a mass shooting. So do you think you downplayed what um, would have been told to Sergeant Mo? Do I think I downplayed? Yeah, to the Saco police officers. No, I don't think I downplayed. I provided them with what the conversations I had at that time. I had not seen this document. Um, it was just based off of my conversations. Um, the text messages I received, obviously from Hodgson the day before. Um, my concept, my con or, um, um, communication with First Arn um, that morning and throughout the day, and my conversation with. Um, card that afternoon on the 15th so i was just um providing them what i knew at that time so i don't believe i was downplaying Well, you told them that um, you would shoot places, but never specifically mentioned here being Saco, right? Are you referring back to the transcript? Yeah, that's what you told Saco PD. If I can remember, I was referring to the text messages. Um, well, no, you were talking about the conversation that he had. I was before, um, but again, I stand by that during my conversation, he made no specific threats. No, my conversation did not um, have anything regarding any shooting 
um, of the places. I think when I was speaking with them, um, I was I brought in my the text messages. Um, the text messages said said that he was going to shoot up the the unit and other places. It, it does say that, but when I was speaking with them, that that's what I was referring to was that that text message. So do you think you gave him a fair representation of what the threats were? I provided them the representation at the time when I was speaking with them, my understanding. Why didn't you just show them the uh, text? It did, uh, because I just didn't, it didn't lead to that. They didn't ask to see it. Um, I assumed that, um, that the information was relayed um, regarding the text, but I did. I did not provide them uh, show them the text messages. It was on your phone. You could have just pulled your phone out, right? Yes, it was on my phone, but it did not occur. So, Then later on in the conversation with the Psycho PD, page 84 at the top, you say that if Card does show up, you would ask Reed to leave the unit, right? Yes. Because Card was a threat to Reed. Well, because during my conversation with Card the day before, he specifically mentioned Reed and that he wanted to punch Reed. So I figured Reed was the focus of his thing. So our plan was to remove Reed um, from the building because it was mentioned during my conversation. So you don't think you were minimizing the threat when you were talking to the Saco PD? No, I don't think I was minimizing. I was providing them my... Um, the information basically I had gathered um, from everything I previously talked about. My intention was not to minimize or anything of that nature. Why not suggest that they charge uh, Card with threatening? Because it was not part of the conversation. Like, they didn't mention any bringing up any charges. It was not part of my uh, it was not in my thought process at that time to pursue charges. So, Why not, though? I mean, because it just, it was mainly we were looking for a check while being on uh, Sarin Card. That was, that was the thought process was doing that, that regarding charges was never brought up either by the Saco Police Department or me. But these threats had caused great consternation amongst your troops, right? I mean, they were calling Saco PD, making sure that they had this information. Saco PD dispatched at least two police officers as a result of this threat. Yes. Why wasn't it part of your thought that maybe somebody should charge Card with a, a crime for doing that? It just, it was not. What about assault on Reed? Why not suggest that uh, somebody charge him with assaulting Reed? It was not part of the conversation. Plus, there actually was no physical assault that occurred back in, and plus it was outside of their jurisdiction anyways. Well, they, how about Hodges? I, but that well, it was for Hodgson to, um, it, it was just, it was not part of that conversation. Why not ask for a psych evaluation? of uh card during my conversation with Saco police department yeah or or suggest sagat hog do a psych evaluation because i i would not dictate how a police do their job i requested that they do a check well-being i'm expecting them to do their job i would not tell them how to do their job um that that answers the question. Well, you were intent on getting 
card to a mental health evaluation in July. In New York. Intended, and we did, yes. Okay. And the facts in, sep in September were more dire in some regards, weren't they? Well, the text message we took seriously, that came from Hodgson, yes. So why not suggest that he get blue papered or some sort of mental health evaluation? Because I trusted that the law enforcement, based on the information they get, that they would take it and run with whatever policy and however they wanted to handle it. And you think you were thorough in the information that you gave them? I answered their their questions. If there was anything more they would have asked, I I answered the questions based on what I knew at that time, um, and my what I knew up to that point based on um, my conversation with the card the day before. And then you talked to Sergeant Schofield from the Saget Hawk PD by phone later that morning, right? Uh, I believe it was just before lunchtime, yes. Turn to exhibit A. That's a transcript of your conversation at uh, 1046 in the morning. Uh, one second, sir. Sorry. I had taken them apart. To the eight, yes. So you knew that Sergeant Schofield was investigating uh, cards threats, right? Leading up to this, I had received a uh, phone call from my first sergeant um, stating that he had received a phone call from I believe, Deputy Sergeant Schofield um, and that they would like to uh, speak with me due to me having uh, spoken with card the day before. Okay. And you knew that Schofield was that person and you wanted to help him, right? Well, he was a part of the, the local police department that we asked to do a check while being on. And Schofield at the beginning of that conversation said that people are worried about Carr doing a mass shooting and he's having hallucinations. It'd been institutionalized for a couple of weeks over the past summer and he's not showing any signs of improvement. And he was just trying to get some answers from your end, right? Yes, that's what it says. Then he asked about uh, cards, access to military weapons and weapons in the house, right? Are you referring to... He says all, all, all of his all weapons from the National Guard have been accounted for. He doesn't have anything in the house. Yes. Yep, that's what it says. And you say that there's no real court order to take his weapons or anything like that. When he went to the institution over there, which I wasn't even part of, mind you, like he didn't keep me in the loop on any of this because of HIPAA. Correct? That's what it says. Is that accurate? Sounds accurate, yes. They did keep you in, you knew his diagnosis, right? What I was referring to this was that um, after being released from the, um, or during my time um, there, Four Winds um, did not, uh, didn't provide me a lot of information what was going on. I did obviously speak with obviously what we referred to earlier, um, but I wasn't really provided. And after upon his discharge, I wasn't provided anything further outside of the emails that we spoke about earlier. You may have wanted to be in the loop more, but you were in the loop, weren't you? If you're referring to what we've already discussed, yes. Mm -hmm. And you don't make any mention of the Army's recommendations about firearms. 
not during this conversation, no. It's something he would have wanted to know, isn't it? You, that would be a question for, for him, whether he, that's something he wanted to know, but it didn't occur during this conversation. Did it just slip your mind or did? Uh, the attention behind this conversation was to answer their questions um, and the conversation didn't lead to that. Would he want to know that these medical providers in July had told you that they were concerned about Card having possession of firearms and that they recommended that you do what you could to have those firearms removed, right? Well, that and that, that's referred to the one that says the family was supposed to uh, take care and remove all the weapons. Okay. But it, it didn't mention the recommendation to you. No, I did not speak to about the recommendations that were provided by the Army. And did, you didn't tell him that you weren't sure where the guns were now. As far as I'm aware, I didn't mention anything about where the outside of the family was supposed to uh, take care of all the weapons and move them. And then you said, I, I lived in New Hampshire, so I was unable to verify any of it in terms of moving the weapons, right? Just so we're all on the same page. Where is that? The top of page 88. Yes. Was that misleading? Misleading. Yeah, I mean, did living in New Hampshire have anything to do with this? Well, what I was referring to is I personally didn't go and verify that the weapons were out of the house. But as the commander, you had contact information for the hospital personnel, right? Yes. I just want to state again that regarding his personally owned firearms, as an Army Reserve officer, I have no jurisdiction or authority over those personal firearms of his. Right. But you were, it was recommended by the Army that you do what you could to see to it that those firearms were removed from his house, right? Yes, that was there. Uh, that was mentioned. Um, and that the family was, the agreement was that the family was to remove the weapons and you're as you've mentioned a couple of times the law enforcement officer and you have multiple law enforcement officers in your unit right we do yes and none of them and you didn't direct any of them to ever contact the saga Hawk sheriff's office or any law enforcement officer in the area about the risk that card posed to the community. That, no, I did not direct any of my, but that, no, it'd be to answer your question, no, I didn't, I didn't ask any of my local law enforcement because it's, um, the idea is that they would, you know, the answer your question, no, I did not have. Okay, then you say, as far as I was told, the weapons had been moved out into a family member's house and you didn't know who, when or who uh, had moved those, or if those weapons had been moved, right? Yep, that's, that's what it says. Okay. And you mentioned the conversation you had with Card the day before, right? That's what it says. About the third of the two thirds of the way down. Mm -hmm. And then on the next page, you 
me say that I just talked to my battalion commander and sergeant major. Who is your battalion commander? Um, at this time, it was um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ryan Vasquez. And who is your sergeant major? Uh, he was um, Sergeant Major uh, Samuel uh, Tomac. Uh, he was the one who had the last hearing. You say, we kind of went through it and hashed it out. And as far as they're concerned, they said, like, as long as you can kind of, if you're out there, he can be uncooperative or whatever, but there's no sense of you guys pushing in. We just wanted to, to check well-being. If you can kind of tell he's there and alive, just kind of document it. What do you mean by document it? What I was um, referring to, one, was that I had spoken with the battalion commander, sergeant major, and we both, everyone agreed that we were looking for a check while being regarding to pushing in. Um, that was um, an idea that I understand that um, tactically it can be a, a, a situation where you're moving into someone's house unless there's exigency um, or if they de deem they need to. Um, that that that's what I was referring to, that tactically it may not be the best position to push in, meaning go into the house, and that all that we were looking for was them to document what they see um, and what they experience out there, but then ultimately um, rely on them to make their decisions on what they wanted to do based on the information they had. And that was it. I was like, if you're, what do you mean by that was it? Well, that's all you asked them to do. I asked them to do a check well being, whatever, what that entails is up to them and their policy and how they want to handle it. Then uh, you go on. Let's turn to uh, page 91. You're talking about Hodgins. And you say, the guy who sent the text was unable to even give specifics on during that. So I don't know like the validity of the text message. Was that a fair statement about Hodgins? What I was, um, the intention behind this conversation um, with uh, Deputy Sergeant Schoolfield was to provide um, one, to answer their question regarding my conversation with Card the day before, um, and two, to provide what we had done already up to that point, um, meaning our, you know, first time speaking with Sergeant Hodgson, um, and to provide some information about our experience with. Um, Hodgson over the years um, that that was what the was referring to with that was that he in the past and I know at the last hearing for Sarn alluded to that in the past he has um, contacted myself as well as other people in the unit um, generally possibly inebriated um, and what I was trying to relay to them was my experience with Hodgson up to that point um, with regards to early morning conversations, text messages. Okay. But you, you've called Hodgson uh, an honest man, right? He, he is an honest man in regards to um, his mistakes that he has made. Um, I will say he is an honest man regarding that um, and that he has honestly is, is expressed his concern um, for, for Sergeant Card. And he was a genuinely good friend to Card. He was, I would agree. And he had no motivation to lie or exaggerate. I, I can't speak to his motives. So then Schofield 
told you that he was going to talk to Ryan Card and ask if uh, they got the guns because he didn't know. Right? On, on the next page. That's what it says, yes. Okay. And then you say something to Schofield. You say, yeah, I mean, I don't think this is going to get any better. And Schofield said, no, nor do I. Right? That's what it says. What did you mean by that? I'm just looking to see if it was mentioned later on. Well, shortly down, what I'm referring to with this um, is a common thing um, that I've experienced with mental health uh, is that you, and it's stated later on that you can lead a horse to water, but you, you know, if he's not, you know, if he's not going to drink it, there's not much you can do. Basically, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. That is the idea that we have provided him the mental health um, you know, uh, got him to the the hospital for mental health, but it ultimately comes down to him and whether he would like uh, further treatment. And so that's what I was referring um, to uh, when, 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 regarding your question. And you had no reason to think that Card was going to get any better, did you? Well, based, I mean, I hoped he would, um, but it sounded, you know, he needed to be the one to reach out. And then, and ultimately it's his mental health comes down on him and he needed to um, receive the, the treatment. So it comes, comes down to him being the one to decide whether his, he furthers in his treatment uh, for mental health. He'd been on your radar since the spring for his misconduct, right? Misconduct. No, not necessarily. Right. I mean, since the spring. I mean, if you're referring to when he started, you know, when I got first reports of of him hearing things, yes, I wouldn't say that's misconduct. But um, and then really, it's the incidents, uh, the kind of over the summer to Ju to July. Um, so yes, I mean, I'm kind of aware of, of he was on my radar at that point. Yes. So, if things were not going to get any better, why not be more proactive in your approach? In what regards? Well, tell the law enforcement officers in Sagadaha County about what happened in New York and what the Army recommended regarding his possession of firearms. Again, that con like those did obviously did not occur during this conversation. Um, but I also expected that the law enforcement to make. I also know that they were involved throughout the summer as well and have their own evaluation or their own um, experience with him. Um, so when we did this check well being, I expect them to do their job and I wasn't going to dictate how they do their job. What are you referring to about local law enforcement in, in July? Oh, did I say July? I meant, I meant in regards to, to May, um, the, the instance that we had speak, spoke about where the, the family had called them. So I know that I was aware that they were involved during the summer. Um, I mean, I just was expecting them to do their their job um, and, and wasn't going to dictate how the police did their job. Okay. You asked for a well-being check. Why not ask for more? Because that was, um, at the time, my conversations with both my first sergeant as well as my battalion leadership, that was what we were looking for. And that's what we requested. Okay. Did you, uh, Talk to any of the main law enforcement officers in your unit about the uh, main yellow flag statue? I spoke with my first sergeant about it. When do you recall talking to him about it? 
believe back in May. In May? I believe, yeah. May have had a further conversation since then, but back in May is what I can recall. What do you recall of the conversation? Um, that he kind of briefly explained that um, that there is a yellow flag law in the state of Maine um, and that um, local law enforcement, that it needs to be done by local law enforcement um, of the jurisdiction of where the person lives. Um, and it's, he kind of phrased it as it's, it's a not impossible, but difficult process from what am I understanding? Again, I don't, I don't know uh, the, the main yellow flag law um, outside of my conversations with, with first time, but that's pretty much what he kind of stated is that if there is a yellow flag law, um, it's, it needs to be done by, you know, law enforcement, um, particularly in this jurisdiction, um, and that it can be a challenge um, to get through and that it depends on, you know, the, the officers that are there, uh, what their their observations as far as what I can under, remember of our conversation. And do you recall any conversation in September regarding the yellow flag or? I can't recall any conver specific conversation. Did you talk about blue papering them at any point? Uh, I'm, I don't know if specifically blue papering. I don't, it's, it seems like more of a, a, a we we have kind of a in, in New Hampshire it's like a um, an IH or involuntary hospitalization thing. So I'm I think maybe we've had conversations about that, but I don't know if that's what you guys consider blue papering. So I mean it may have been brought up, but I can't can't speak to it. And did you ever talk to a JAG officer about your options? No. Is one even available to you if you have these sorts of questions? I mean. I will say that there's phone numbers out there that if we re reached out, you know, or I could go through the chain of command, there are ways to reach out to them, but it did not occur. Okay. Let's turn quickly to exhibit 21. What is this one titled? It's an email from um, Jason Rogers to Dean Malo. Uh, give me one second. Ah, there it is. You see that? I, I see it, yes. Um, this is a email from uh, Jason Rogers to uh, Dean DeMello. Do you know him? He is our uh, division, um, for lack of a better way to describe it, JAG or legal. Okay. And uh, you're copied on it and they're asking about communications about personally owned weapons stored with cards, family members, right? Yes. And he says, I'm reaching out to Captain Reamer, the company commander for card to verify and provide input to this request for information. Yes. Right. And the next page has your response. Yep. It says similar to Mr. Rogers email that Sergeant cards, Discharge from Four Winds Hospital, a plan had already been developed and implemented that Sergeant Card's personally owned weapons were to be removed and secured by Sergeant Card's family, right? Yep. By implemented, did you mean to say that they had actually been moved? The guns had actually been moved? No, what I meant was that a plan had been developed. Which I, at the time, what I'm referring to is when he was discharged, that the plan had been developed by the family, that the, the weapon, his personal firearms would be removed from the home. That's what I was referring to. And then it says, it was determined that it was not necessary to offer to have him voluntarily secure his weapons at the Saco Reserve Center, right? 
That's what it says, yeah. I, I thought from your earlier testimony, it was never even considered. I mean, I did speak to that. Um, I think what this is, I was referring to is that obviously, Obviously, we did not have that that conversation, so I did not have any um, conversation regarding having the this personally owned firearms into the um, moved into the reserve center. I was um, in this email. I guess I'm referring to um, that the family had already um, the plan had been for the family to remove the the weapons from the the home, and that that was maybe the reason why I, it didn't come to my head as being a reason to um ask um but i will say that from my earlier testimony that it didn't uh that during my the time i cannot recall that that being part of the conversation until later when someone asked if we had done that it was it was an option but just never mentioned it was if during during the time it was not one that came to my mind um okay because uh, we were all under the impression the family was removing the firearms from the uh, from the home. Okay. I want to finish just with um, Exhibit 12 again. Your interview after the shooting with Terry James from the State Police and Alex Davis and Timothy Range from the yes. Army. And the, at the bottom of page 27, They're, in the interview, they're talking about things, uh, you know, in retrospect, you would do differently. And the range says, we can always do better. And you say, there's things I should have done. Can you tell us what you think in retrospect you would have done differently? I mean, as a, a, a leader um, in the Army Reserves, uh, especially with an incident as tragic as this one, um, it's I would think it's reasonable that after a tragedy, um, you, as a leader, you think back over, you know, what you've done um, and how to, because in the Army, we're always looking to improve. Um, so I think... Um, what would have been uh, helpful um, would have been um, being a little bit more forward um, regarding his medical like finding out his medical um and the follow-ups of the stuff being a little bit more forward um regarding regarding that uh, and i mean at the time that i was speaking with this um to them it was shortly you know a couple of days after um so obviously i was trying to rear just like with everyone else on all that happened um so i may not you know I think everybody, you know, in any process of this is is looking back over um, what they've done and, and hoping to prevent, and which is why I'm assuming the commission is here to prevent this from happening again. That answers the question. Just to follow up, when you say forward about the medical, are you saying in contact with the providers more or what? I, I, I wish it would have been a, more like may may have been like a little bit more forward at, attempting to call a few a few more times would have guaranteed anything changed i don't know right but that's that's what i could i could think of what about sharing information with the Sagadoc sheriff's office 
Would you do something differently in, in retrospect? No, I mean, at the time when I I provided them all the information now, because mind you, obviously, I think everyone can be um, understand that when we're talking now today, um, we're looking through the lens that he was a shooter at the time. Um, but at that time, we did we that had not occurred yet. So my conversations with them were based off of the information I had at that time. Um, so I don't necessarily think I would have changed anything because I relied on the local law enforcement to do their job. Um, and and I think anyone in the, the unit, when we reached out for a check while being expected um, them to do their job. I have nothing further, Chair. Other questions from the other? I have two lines of inquiry. As we yeah. have two lines of inquiry. Yes, ma'am. Um, on September 15th, 2023, you received the email early in the morning from Sergeant Hodgson. The, the text message? Yeah, the text, sorry. Yes. Did you ever speak with Hodgson about that at that, any time before October 25th? Directly with, with Hodgson? Oh, before 20th? Yes, before the I shooting. cannot recall that I had a conversation with Hodgson specifically about that. Was Hashin at Sako on the 16th? I cannot recall if he was. Uh, cannot recall at this time. <clears throat> and the other line is, you have said on a couple of occasions that you expected the law enforcement here in Maine to do their job. Mm -hmm. Was it your job to complete the developmental counseling form? That was a requirement of me, yes. Did you do that? I did not. And was it your job to ensure that CARD followed through with the mental health treatment that had been ordered him, that he had been ordered to comply with by the Army? Was to supervise and to the, the and follow up with that, yes. That was your job? It's part of my job, yes. Did you do that? I personally did not follow up with him regarding that. Did you delegate it to anyone who did? I personally don't delegate, but I do know that first Sergeant's testimony said he did reach out. I'm later. sorry, could you say that again? I'm sorry. Um, I personally did not delegate that to anyone. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yes Deborah. Hi, I'm Hi. Uh, Debbie Bader, and I have a couple of questions. Part of our concern is what was known about Sergeant Card's mental health status, particularly on September 16th. And you had indicated when referencing document three, which is a fairly long detailed um, summary by Corporal Moat about just all the information that he had received, the text message from um, Sergeant Hodgson, et cetera, et cetera. I think you testified that you hadn't received, hadn't seen document three prior to your conversations with Sacco and um, Sergeant Schofield on the 16th. Is that correct? That's correct. But I think you also testified that you had spoken to Corporal Moat prior to those conversations with Sacco and Sergeant Schofield. Mm -hmm. Did he, in those conversations with you, provide essentially the gist of what is in document three? During my conversation with him on the, the 15th, um, he, as I testified, that was the conversation I had and that I can recall. Um, I obviously have had conversations with him and he has been involved in this process um, from the get-go. So I think I mean, I, I was aware, um, but maybe not specifics um, regarding to like any of the personal conversations he had um, with anybody. Um, so I can't speak to what um, his conversations. 